Good evening and welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where you some of the art and science of games. We are back with another developer interview. My guests tonight are from the studio This I Dreamt, who recently released uh, their uh, long-developed game, Long Gone Days. This is a uh, JRPG-inspired game about war and conflict and trying to understand what is going on with it. So uh, please welcome from the studio, Camilla and Pablo. How are you both doing today? It's fine, I'm fine, and you? <laughs> I yeah. am doing all right. How about uh, you, Pablo? How's everything? Yeah, doing really well. Uh, it's been uh, a bit warm uh, these last couple of days here on, on Chile, so, but uh, it's been fine. <laughs> Well, uh, it's definitely a pleasure to have both of you on, and uh, congratulations on the release of uh, Long Gone Days as well. I know that this has been a, a very long-developed game, and something I'm sure we'll be talking about in the uh, coming minutes. So, I guess to get things started with, if you wouldn't mind, to, uh, I guess, giving like a brief introduction, like who you are, what is your background, and for the people listening to us, like what is Long Gone Days about? Uh, well, I'm Camila. I'm the uh, artist and co-writer of uh, Long Gone Days. Uh, and I'm the original creator of Long Gone Days because it's an idea I had when I was a teenager. And I pretty much built my life around it, <laughs> learning the things I needed to become a developer. Um, well, um, that's like the main part of it. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm Pablo. Uh, I also the co-writer of the game, and I'm the game designer. Uh, I was in charge of basically building most of the systems in the game, and also the uh, the majority of the level design in the game. And regarding my background, I. Th this is my first like real uh, game dev uh, work. With Camila, we've both participated in like game jams and stuff like that. But uh, she has a lot more experience than me on the on the game dev world. And also uh, on our team, we are a three people team. And there's uh, our programmer, who's he's called Camilo. And he couldn't be here today, but uh, he's like he was in charge of building everything, so we could uh, use. Uh, we, we basically use all of, all of his tools to to develop the game. All right, sounds good. And I know that uh, I've been seeing uh, Camilla post about Long Gone Days for a very long time. I think I follow you on Twitter. I've seen like a lot of your reposting. So I know this has been a very a long time coming. Uh, for the people listening to us now, how long has Long Gone Days been in development for? Or was in development for, I should say. Uh, well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> because um, when I was uh, around 12 years old, I started writing about Long Gone Days and I, ha I had discovered RPG Maker. So I made the very uh, first uh, I don't know, uh, attempt <laughs> and making the game uh, back then. But the real, real development of, uh, for example, for the demo, the demo was uh, made during um, late 2015. And the real development of the game that it's, it's out today on, on uh, Steam, uh, it was developed uh, during, uh, at the beginning of, uh, 2017. All right. And what inspired you uh, to focus on Long Gone Days? Uh, at first, it was something like I just really like RPG games. But uh, back then, um, well, that was during like the 2002, for example. <laughs> um, I, I really wanted something that uh, was based on the on a modern day setting, 
I was just, I wasn't even familiar with Persona games, even though um, Persona 1 and 2 had already come out, but they weren't that popular back then. And I really liked, uh, for example, Final Fantasy VIII. And I liked that setting that wasn't like in a fantasy world with a me medieval, uh, with a me medieval setting or with princesses and stuff like that. So I really wanted to write something that was set in our in our times. And that's why, uh, even though I didn't like like uh, war um, military stuff. That was like my first thought because uh, that's like the equivalent of uh, knights and stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, so I started learning more about that, um, and that's how I ended up <laughs> thinking of this story. All right, and I guess uh, uh, for you, Paul, since you said that you did a lot of like the uh, combat design and like level design itself. I guess how has like that like changed or has it changed at all like since you first worked with Camilla in terms of long gone days? Um, what we work most uh, is that the first uh, demo or main piece that was made uh, only by Camilla at that point was made on RPG Maker. Uh, so we, at that time, she used like a, a tail base. Uh, uh, like uh, art and uh, level design. Uh, so when we started working on the final game that was made using Unity, we sort of uh, copied the way that RPG Maker worked. So we basically uh, kept the most of the ideas, the main ideas that were present on the on the RPG Maker demo. Uh, regarding the combat system, it was much easier to implement on Unity than on RPG Maker. Like Camila had to make like each, because I don't know if people know, but uh, our main battle system is consists of a like a, a first person view where you can aim different uh, parts of the body of the enemy. So it's like uh, really similar to like the Fallout uh, uh, battle system or bat system. Uh, but uh, doing that on RPG Maker, when Camila built that, uh, it was like a really hard work. But with the, the tools that Unity has, it was much easier. So we call, could explore uh, a bit more uh, that. And the level design, well, we were being working on a game for like, I don't know, like six years. Uh, makes you kind of learn a lot of things about your own game and about your own process. So uh, at the later stages of development, we already like knew how to use our tools and how to build more interesting levels and more interesting puzzles. So it was uh, like uh, it was like a good uh, uh, exercise on like learning uh, uh, level design and to uh, we wanted to apply the, the, the new stuff that we learned on the older levels. So that helped us a lot to make the game feel more polished at, at the end. And uh, with uh, developing Long Gone Days, uh, as the two of you said, it was originally built in uh, RPG Maker, like the first concept. What engine did you end up switching to for the uh, main game? Uh, we are use uh, Unity. Okay. And I guess uh, for like developers like listening to us, like how was it like making that switch from building originally RPG Maker to Unity? I guess in terms of like AI game dev standpoint. Yeah, um, after uh, releasing the demo of the game, we were using RPG Maker. Uh, I don't actually remember the, the name, but uh, it had uh, some problems like a memory leak. 
So even though the demo was like 30 uh, minutes long, uh, it will crash on lower end computers because it will save too much stuff on their memories. <laughs> so, and also uh, because it was a game about languages, we really wanted to be able to uh, have localization and maybe have the, the chance to port the game to, into consoles. And RPG Maker didn't allow that. So uh, when we, uh, after we had a successful crowdfunding campaign, we decided that we really needed to switch uh, to an engine that supported those things. And uh, we chose Unity because uh, <laughs> it's what our programmer uh, was uh, used to. Uh, but yeah, it meant that we had to start from scratch. But that also allowed us to make the game even better that, than it was before. Um, because I, I tend to hate my art just after like a couple of weeks weeks passes. <laughs> I was really happy to be able to redo all the <laughs> art from the demo. So yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't that slow, I think. All right. And uh, speaking about the uh, art for the game, uh, you also did like the like the portrait art or like the uh, first person uh, RPG combat art. Yeah, all the of the art is in the game is mine. Um, there were some friends that uh, designed some characters, but yeah, uh, all of it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And what was it like coming up, <coughs> excuse me, with like the art style? Because I really liked, uh, like the portrait art and especially like the kind of view when you're in like the first person combat. Um, well, it's just my regular <laughs> art style. So, because it was a lot of work, I said, like, I need to use the kind of art style I'm comfortable with, because that, that way it will be faster to produce all the art I have to make for this game, which was a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to go back to kind of like the general gameplay for uh, Long Gone Days, in terms of, I guess, like, how you wanted to, like, have the player, like, explore, like, the world and the story, how has, like, has that changed at all since, like, the original concept? Or how did, like, uh, you and the team, like, settle on, like, that? At, or on, like, what is in the game right now? It's, like, how you wanted the player to experience it. Mm, I don't think it changed that much since the demo. Because the main parts that we wanted to accomplish in the final game were already there. For example, what we one of the things that we wanted to show was uh, the different languages that the NPC were speaking, and how the player can uh, interact with the sort of situations. Uh, in our game, we have what we call the interpreter system. That uh, when you are in a new country where you don't speak the language, for example, in Germany. Uh, you need an, a character in your party that's, that knows the language so he can interpret the, what their NPCs are saying or what is in a sign on the street or something like that. So that was already on the demo. Uh, we also had, like, because our game is 2D, top down, like a lot of old school RPGs, we wanted to. Uh, use the, uh, the some of the same tools that they use on uh, puzzle building. So we have the like the typical like pushing like Sokoban style puzzles, and also we wanted the player to to feel a bit free regarding where they they could go. We wanted to add a lot of uh, like alternative routes in some dungeons. We wanted to use. Uh, uh, some ways in which the, the player could avoid certain battles if they wanted to, because most of our message in the game is about avoiding conflict, avoiding war. Uh, and also, 
we wanted to we wanted to focus more on exploring in general than on on battle because our our game is mostly focused on the narrative side of the of the game so we're and, and not so much in the in the combat or on the rpg elements like so we wanted to uh, make the the levels feel alive and to also help you uh, know more about the story and the state of the world in our game setting. So that's more of the stuff that we focus on. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like making it a like more like contemporary or modern RPG, like go back to what Camilla was saying earlier. I guess what was it like working in like obviously in a real world setting or trying to build a game around real world setting, obviously versus what we see from most RPGs being, you know, fantasy or sci fi or somewhere you don't have to worry about, you know, a nation or characterizations happening in real life. To make sure that we weren't hurting other people's uh, sensibilities <laughs> while representing some countries, we did work with some uh, we, we we talk frequently with people, for example, from Russia, uh, to make sure that the representation was wasn't um, like offensive, uh, or to make sure it was more accurate. For example, when I first designed the uh, church in Russia, uh, this friend from Russia told me that. Uh, because I made like, I had put like a lot of uh, uh, banks uh, sitting in chairs <laughs> inside the church. And this friend from Russia told me that uh, in Russian Orthodox uh, churches don't have chairs. People have to be standing up. So stuff like that helped uh, make the game more great. He also sent me a lot of uh, like blueprints from uh, churches so we could make something more accurate. We also explored the the cities a lot uh, through <laughs> uh, Google Maps <laughs> and seeing documentaries and talking to people in general or browsing forums and uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and we oh, sorry, uh, we were really lucky because uh, since the first demo came out we found a lot of fans from different parts of the world. So whenever we needed to uh, know something specific about uh, a country that we were working on, or maybe we have some, some doubts about like certain cultural things, uh, we could always go to them and ask them, or even like small um, like typos or stuff like that they were always willing to help us and trying to make the game like we we didn't try to recreate uh, actual cities because it was really hard and we <laughs> having to adapt that to pixel art and stuff like that but we wanted to f at least feel like you were in the place that we wanted to represent so having that fans uh, from Germany, from Russia, from Poland that uh, really helped us uh, during the development of the game. Yeah, uh, also something I wanted to mention is that I think one of the hardest parts of um, setting a game in the real world and in our time is that a lot of stuff is copyrighted or it can get you sued. <laughs> So, for example, well, they, they won't sue you, but some typical examples that you can use the Red Cross in games. Uh, so we also had to make sure that if we were going to put real weapons in the game, we had to slightly change their names or uh, stuff like that. <laughs> for example, there's also the uh, subway station in Germany, and we still changed it a bit so it didn't look exactly the same just in case <laughs> mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that i thought was very interesting that uh, uh, you were mentioning earlier is about having the idea that 
as the game goes on, you need to have, like, translators in your party in order to be able to understand the local language. And we really haven't seen, like, many games, like, deal with, like, the language barrier, at least in that respect. What was it like, I guess, like, building that or having that integrated into Long Gone Days? Well, I'm really... I really like learning uh, other languages. Um, and back then, uh, during the first steps of the development, I was learning Russian. So that's a bit of how the idea uh, started to being developed. Because since we're not native, uh, native uh, English speakers, we have always felt like foreign girls. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to communicate that uh, through the game. And it, I think the idea came pretty much naturally because we always see in movies how these, I don't know, this uh, character from America travels to a country far away from on the other side of the world and everyone speaks English. <laughs> and if for non-English speakers, that's always like kind of a shock. <laughs> So we wanted to show these languages because sometimes we can even learn a bit or try to, like, uh, I don't know, decipher <laughs> its the word, uh, the, what they're saying through context. And I think that's, like, uh, that's really fun. And you can even learn something from it. Mm hmm And... Uh, as another question I want to ask both of you about in terms of like the uh, RPG combat side of things, one of the points that uh, Pablo brought up and it's on the store page is that the encounters are a handmade. There is no random encounters in Long Gone Days. And that's always a very tricky thing to balance in terms of RPG design, not only in terms of how each individual encounter is set up, but also how it relates to the greater progression. And I want to ask both of you about. Uh, the decision to keep this as being fixed encounters, and what was it like building like the RPG side with that knowledge that every fight was going to be one hundred percent like handmade in that respect? Mm, well, regarding that, uh, as I said earlier, our main focus on the game was uh, regarding the storyline. So we wanted to avoid uh, having a grinding on our game. So that was one of the first reasons why we wanted uh, fixed uh, encounters. Uh, taking that into account, we also uh, make sure that we have the opportunity to make some encounters in relevant to the story. So we could add uh, special dialogues or uh, cutscenes uh, in between the fights and interact with uh, the different systems related to uh, the the story and the RPG mechanics that we had. Uh, when we started to think about balance, it was kind of uh, good for some stuff, but it was hard for others. For example, because we knew uh, that we have fixed encounters, we knew when when they were in which part of the story they were, they will happen and which characters you are going to have available for you. Uh, it was easy to try to balance them and uh, uh, in relation to the different skills the the different party members uh, had. Uh, and also uh, regarding the different like uh, item dr drops that you could find along your journey, but also it made it that uh, you really need like a difficult curve that was uh, more like like a line <laughs> because uh, you couldn't uh, have uh, maybe some really hard encounters in the middle of uh, like a dungeon because you really didn't have a way to uh, level up your party or so we we had to take uh, that into account and also uh, try to make the enemies uh, as varied as we 
can so it wasn't like it, it didn't feel boring to the player to have to fight the same enemies uh, over and over and uh, so with that we try to uh, integrate also the different uh, locations that we were uh, on the game like for example the different countries or the different kind of enemies that we were fighting were re related to uh, some uh, specific uh, like um, uh, al how do you say this uh, like there were aligned to uh, some specific enemy that wasn't uh, like your typical soldier. So we had, for example, in Germany, we have two, two types of enemies. Ones are part of a political party that you find are working with the main bad guys of the, of the game. And also, on the other hand, you fight uh, some goons from uh, like a mafia type guy. So taking that variety help us uh, build some uh, some like RPG archetypes like the, the tank, the the warrior, the the mage, but without feeling like they were that archetype. Uh, so yeah, it it help us a lot to maintain like some. Uh, a story uh, important focus on on the combat and on the the main the main game. And um, another thing is that <clears throat> we uh, regarding battles, uh, all three of us are fans of RPG games, uh, RPG games. <laughs> sorry, and uh, we noticed that uh, as we grow older, we don't have time to play like really long RPGs, so it's kind of sad when you're an RPG fan who doesn't have time. So we really wanted to make a game that uh, wasn't that long, so you could remember where you were on, um, because if the game is like 100 hours long, you... I Personally, I don't finish them, because I can't find the time to do, or I already forgot where I was, and stuff like that. So we think that battles sometimes also are just like a some kind of block or obstacle to finish the game more than adding some content, real content to the game. So we wanted to make like the game we we would love to be able to play. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was something that I talked about in uh, one of my last books when I focused on the RPG genre, is that one of the Things it feels like that has changed in terms of RPG design in the past like 20 years has been this idea that people wanting more quality of experiences where you don't like the days in which you could just say to someone, hey, this game's a hundred hours long and that'll be considered a positive or I think uh, past us. And it does feel like it's a lot horror to like it's like get someone mole to play through a game where every five steps there could be another fight and this fight can take one to five minutes and then you take another two steps and there's another fight and we just repeat it and i guess uh, with a uh, long on days in terms of like the difficulty of the game this is something that's another like very challenging aspect of rpg design i guess how did like the team like figure out as you said like the focus of the game is more like on the narrative and the storytelling you didn't want like the combat to be like the forefront so what was it like figuring out, I guess, like how easy or how hard you wanted to make combat in it? Well, like Camila said, we wanted the game to be, I, I didn't, I don't want to say too easy to beat, but at least it wasn't something that was going to keep you like uh, fighting uh, or running through, uh, trying to run through a wall. Like we wanted mm -hmm. to... The, the game to feel a bit challenging, but not too much. So we wanted to to make at least the more basic encounters uh, really easy to to pass through. But uh, on the boss fights, even though uh, some people have found them a bit hard, what we doing them is basically the same that we the, the, the same way we work with the the regular like uh, 
uh, fights. Like we don't add too many difficult new mechanics or uh, changes in the way that uh, the system works. We wanted to be uh, as straightforward as we we can. And one of the most important part that we think are in our boss fights is that um, in every one of them you can speak with the with the boss. And you have a, a chance to to try to convince them, or we we call them debates. So you, I know you can't really convince convince them, but show them what is your your point of view, and that helps you uh, more than beating the boss. It that's the part that helps you a lot on getting like different kind of rewards at the end of the fight or different kind of endings in our different levels. So we also wanted to focus the, on that aspect of, of the fight and make it uh, the more important bit. So yeah, it's it's not more it's not as hard as it or other RPGs are. And also because uh, uh, we can't have like the player to level up uh, or be stronger than the boss uh, by grinding. Um, there's also, uh, because a lot of our audience are uh, fans of visual novels. So they are more on it for the narrative aspect of the game. Uh, but others who want like a more challenging experience, they sometimes uh, add less party members to their party <laughs> so that uh, battles can be harder or they make their own rules. So it's been fun to, to see what they come up with and how they manage to beat every boss <laughs> with their own rules. And in terms of like your like party dynamics, how many characters are actually like playable in long gone days? Uh, there are six uh, party members that you can play with. Uh, you can have uh, four on your party. All right. And another aspect of the combat system that uh, the two of you were mentioning, I want to kind of like go a little bit more detail about, is kind of like the locational based damage. You uh, mentioned, of course, like the uh, that system uh, from uh, Fallout. Uh, what was kind of like the uh, challenge or I guess like coming up with having locational based damage in a like a turn based RPG like this. Mm, well, uh, at the beginning we were uh, inspired by uh, our research uh, on uh, military and in uh, particular is on snipers. Our main character is a sniper, so one of the things that we learn was that they have uh, they they can sh take shots at different body parts expecting different uh, results so if you want like to incapacitate someone instead of killing them or stuff like that so uh, we wanted to show a bit of that uh, on our game on our battle system so for example you can shot certain body part at and that may uh, paralyze a character. Or if you shot a different body part, uh, that will have more damage or do less damage or have more evasion. And that's the way that we wanted to, to show that. And also we have uh, some mech uh, enemies that have different din dynamics than uh, the human enemies. So it was something that we tried to take advantage uh, and maybe, I don't want to say like, maybe make it feel more realistic, but maybe make it feel uh, like uh, something that was uh, inspired or taken from like uh, a shooting game, uh, mainly because of the nature of the of the character background, like uh, like I said, our main character was uh, a former military. Uh, he was a former sniper, so we wanted to take that uh, like that uh, FPS uh, 
a feel and add it to the tomb base combat. And uh, with the kind of like the uh, sniper player, I know from the story page and from what I I spent a little bit of time with the game, you have kind of like the I guess like uh, shooting gallery sections where you're kind of like able to like aim and kill enemies like that or just shoot them, and then you go into the actual combat itself. With like I guess like balancing this game with kind of like the real world messaging or again with the kind of story you wanted to tell. One of the challenges like of like any kind of game, especially games that take place in like a contemporary or topical times, is that you know that line you have to walk in terms of are you glorifying what you're trying to show or are you trying to tell things from a nuanced perspective? I know this is something that from the store page, something that the three of you really do care about. In terms of writing the game like this. As you said, as another point, you're saying that a lot of your fan base is more on like the visual novel side. What was it like writing the story of Long Gone Days in terms of, I guess, trying to depict everything in the way that you want it to be? Well, uh, one of the main focus that we wanted to to show from the very beginning was the how uh, combat how war uh, affects the civilians. Uh, like I, I said before, our main character is a, a former military sniper. He He's a part, at the beginning of the game, he's a part of a private military company. But after having uh, one of these like sniper mode uh, or shooting galleries, as you, as you call them, uh, events in the game, he realized that he wasn't uh, shooting uh, necessarily enemy combatants and that makes him feel sick. Uh, he basically uh, wants to resign at that, at that point because he's, he feels betrayed by his uh, company. He feels like he should be protecting civilians instead of trying to harm them. So. That's, that is the motivation that the main character has to try to stop the conflict that his uh, former army is trying to begin, and also to help civilians to def defend themselves. And that's what brings him to meet uh, different people from uh, Russia, Germany, and Poland in our game. Uh, so taking that focus, away from necessarily the military side of the of the game and putting in on the civilians trying to defend themselves we wanted to show not only like a way to like also glorify like resistance or like uh, revolutionaries or something like that you know but also show uh, how sometimes people normal people have to take this uh, the, the take part in trying to defend themselves and how that affects them emotionally and how that uh, show how hard it is to live in a situation uh, like that, like how hard it is to be part of the, an, an armed conflict, uh, especially if it's happening in, in, your, in your home. Uh, we have, for example, a character that uh, from the very beginnings, from the first time that you met him, he doesn't want to fight, so he doesn't have a weapon, but you can have them in your party during combat. He only uses a, uh, his skills and also has a special command that instead of attacking the, the enemies, he can boost your party uh, in different kinds of ways. So he can boost your, your stats, he can heal you, uh and and so on so we wanted to show that there's people who not necessarily want to fight people who feel really affected with uh having to to experience these situations how uh the friends of the party members are also affected by this uh, kind of situation, how sometimes uh, entire communities ha can come together and, and unite uh, in trying to stop uh, uh, a war or an assault on their country. 
and stuff like that. So we wanted to try and not be to focus on the actual uh, fighting, the actual combat, and try to show more ways to be uh, empathetic is the word, word, but show empathy to towards the people that are, are suffering in, in those kind of situations. That's what our, our, our main focus. And in terms of like the like character interactions and how it relates to the game, one thing we didn't mention yet is that you have a morale system built in based on the various choices you make. And I was wondering if you could uh, go into a little bit more detail about like how morale works and uh, what was it like building that system for long, long days? Uh, well, the at, at first the morale system, it was kind of hard to to balance and to basically to, to add into the game because one of the first things that we wanted to to show and do to uh, add to the idea of having some sort of uh, uh, empathy to the the situations that were happening during the game was that uh, we wanted uh, combat to have some sort of um, to take some kind of toll in you or in the party member like have every time you you were fighting you were kind of losing something or try or some or affecting your mental health in a way because during the research we also found like uh, soldiers uh, really suffer when they go to to combat. I, I mean, it sounds obvious, but when you watch uh, other games or or movies that depict uh, conflict, like you don't really see that part too much. So we wanted to that to be uh, in the front and center of our game. And uh, so at the first uh, time that we added a morale system. Uh, it was uh, connected to our battle system in a way in which each time you use a skill instead of using something like mana, for example, you were uh, wasting your morale a little bit. But that made it really hard to balance because you we, we didn't want to have too many items that restore morale because uh, having a relation to your mental health as a character it was also uh, related uh, directly to the story and how the player reacted to uh, different uh, uh, scenes in the game so we finally make the choice to remove the morale system from the combat and now it's more related to the choices that you make during uh, the different dialogue options. And you can also gain morale uh, or lose morale uh, during the side quests that you do on during the game. Uh, most of the side quests in the game are about helping people in different situations. So taking uh, making the choice to help someone uh, helps you boost your morale and also uh, in, in the way that you interact with the bosses during the, uh, your debates also help to raise your morale if you make the correct choices in, in, on those instances. And yeah. depending on, on how much morale you have, uh, by the end of the game or by the end of the different chapters in our game, you could get different endings. So that made it like uh, really connected to to our story. Mm -hmm. I was just about to ask about uh, having or writing the game around multiple endings as well. Um, well, that was uh, a pretty hard part of the because when you're enjoying a game, people, even if the ending is good, people are always sad that the game ended. 
So it took us a long time to write the both endings. And uh, we usually have like this canon ending. And we need to think about a second option, at least, that isn't uh, like a waste of time for the players. So we, it was a really long process of trial and error to come up with an idea that seems satisfying in, in both versions. Yeah, and, and also it needed to feel like plausible like uh, not something that was uh, like the player ended like what that ending did not make, doesn't make any sense like it wasn't it wasn't easy to to try to figure out uh, the way that we wanted to end the game uh, even even the the negative ending that we didn't want people to to see because that basically means that you uh miss most of the morale decisions uh it still needed to feel like it was i don't want to say it like satisfactory but uh still it, it needed to feel a, a bit realistic or that it made sense that uh, things ended that, w that way so uh, it was it was tough mm -hmm. especially uh, when we see games that like have like multiple endings like this, it's always tricky in terms of like uh, characterizations. Like, how do you show different endings without kind of like betraying you know how you wrote your characters previously to that point? Right. Um, let me see. I'm trying to think if there's any other questions I have for the two of you. And with regards to long gone days in terms of development, story, design, anything that either one of you uh, want to discuss. Or any that we miss in terms of developing the game? Uh, well, we spend a lot of time on Steam Early Access. And I think that helped us a lot on building the game. Because it, being us three working on it, it was a bit hard to, to get uh, real feedback. So having the game on early access helped us a lot, not only in like finding bugs or finding uh, typos and stuff like that, but it also helped us uh, on one hand to, to see that what we were working on was uh, something that people enjoyed and that people wanted to see more of. And also uh, to uh, find like really good feedback regarding the expectations that the player had with our game and to uh, take a really good look at what we needed to fix in terms of uh, not only balance but the, the story, the, the setting uh, the and the way that the characters interact with each other. Like we, it made us uh, made a lot of uh, design decisions. For example, the focus on the story, uh, it was something that we decided after the early access because we we saw uh, that was the part that our player base felt more connected to. Uh, they really enjoyed the interaction with the players, uh, also, I mean, with the party members. So we ended up adding more of that. Uh, we wanted to show different ways in which the the characters uh, uh, show themselves, show their personalities, show their point of view, uh, and that I think most of that came from the the early access experience. And also, uh, it helped us because we. Uh, we didn't have like uh, a lot of resources to develop the game, so having uh, like an, an steady income uh, with uh, the, the chance to, of selling the game before it was uh, ready uh, was a really big help. And I guess to build off of that, like working on uh, long one days during early access, uh, you mentioned, of course, like finding bugs and quality of life features like that. Were there any like major examples of something that had to be changed or something that your fan base requested that you found out uh, during the early access process? 
Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the major changes uh, we made uh, after early access version uh, was how the morale system worked. Because initially, the morale was like uh, the SP mm -hmm. during battles. So uh, even though it made logic in our heads, because that meant that like it's like the psychological damage that uh, characters take after using their most uh, powerful skills on ha having to hurt others. Um, but in the end, that meant that players rarely used their skills because they didn't want to uh, lose their morale. <laughs> so battles uh, where people were only using the attack uh, option, and that made battles really, really boring. So we made uh, we changed the uh, oh, and also it was really hard to balance because uh, we needed to. Uh, to make possible that players could uh, like uh, could uh, could heal their morale so that they are not on zero during the rest of the game. So that also uh, meant that we couldn't make too many morale choices through the game. So it was kind of a mess. <laughs> so we ended up changing the entire moral system into something more internal, like the, I don't know, like in Shin Megami Tensei games, where you take some choices where you align with chaos, law, um, neutral. So that way we could make a lot of bigger changes to the story through your uh, dialogue options. And I... To uh, build off that point about kind of like have originally time morality to skill or skill usage, that's another challenge that we see in any kind of like RPG based game where if you tell the player that you know this is going to affect how they fight in combat, then obviously people are going to try and min max that as you know efficiently as possible. And it can sometimes, I guess, like they can kind of efficient out the fun. Of playing these games, and we've seen this in a lot of titles. I mean, for like anyone watching us record right now, we've discussed many times on the channel about the hoarder syndrome in RPGs, where you will never use that skill or that item, even though your characters are like two points away from dying. Yeah, that's that's really something hard to balance, but it's something that even I do sometimes. Like, I don't want <laughs> to use the their item that fully heals your party because I may need it later and then it's the end of the game, I never use it. But I don't really have an answer to how to balance that or how to make it uh, more, uh, like how to convince the, the player to use them. But we do try to make uh, a lot of items uh, or make it easy to get some items that you really need uh, in order to survive. And also, uh, after every battle, you can restore a bit of your uh, SP. So if you use some uh, uh, to beat an enemy, you can gain it back uh, after after winning the fight. So in that way, you also don't have like an excuse to not use uh, okay. your more powerful skills all right i think with that i am just about uh out of question I'm trying to think if there's anything else i guess in terms of the side quests for uh long gone you uh the two of you mentioned of course like wanting to be more like you're helping people like it's not like you know go kill 27 rats somewhere and uh, collect their resources uh, what was it like, I guess, like writing or coming up with the uh, side quests for the game? Uh, well, something that inspired us a bit is that some CD Projekt Red uh, games had a lot of these uh, side quests that were more, uh, that where you could, could learn more about the world in the game uh, instead of just these delivery quests. Uh, that you usually see in games. And at first, we did have some of these, like, oh, I need two apples and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, I think one of them is still in the game. But <laughs> um, but uh, we thought that those 
we don't need like uh, quantity over quality. We really want some stories that like players feel really happy about completing. And when we released the game on early access, uh, people really, really liked the the quest about the and it, it was pretty simple. But the, the quest the quest about the uh, spray cats and dogs. Uh, that's a quest that uh, where people are evacuating the city because of the of the war and a lot of animals are left behind. So you need to take them and bring them with you to the ferry. And after we saw how much people like that, and they made like a lot of fun art with the main party carrying all these animals, uh, we noticed that yeah, it was really important to make them to make you feel something. And um, we were also uh, like, uh, it, it was hard because we didn't uh, want them to feel like oh, but we should be like fighting this army instead of helping other people. But that's the thing that civilians are the protagonist in this, this game and you really need to help them to, to get to know what's going on in the city. And another aspect that we focused on our game is that, well, our protagonist is, like we said, is a part of the military, a private military company that was uh, basically his home from since the day he was born. So he doesn't know much about the outside world, outside of like the military. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the side quests that we have are related to him finding out more about uh, different ways that people live, uh, different uh, like uh, type of jobs that they are in in the real world, uh, and so we have him like uh, helping uh, taking photographs. We have him helping uh, uh, like a, a mascot on a from a like a grocery store. We have him. Uh, I don't know, like uh, giving speeches. Like uh, he has to. We 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 used him to to explore more about how the different places that we that we explore are are at that point in time, and also how are, are they are being affected by everything that's happening around them. And the one point I wanted to clarify in terms of the RPG side. Is there or are there like leveling up and experience in Long Long? Because I didn't quite notice that during my play. I noticed I unlocked new skills, but I didn't see we actually had like a leveling in it. Uh, we have a leveling system, but it's internal. Uh, we don't have experience. We have like certain milestones that, that trigger the, the leveling system. So each time you defeat a boss, uh, you gain new skills and your stats uh, go up uh, a percentage. But we didn't make that uh, really. Uh, sh we didn't. We don't show that uh, to the player because we didn't want them to think that uh, you could grind some in some way or like uh, get uh, some advantage uh, by fighting other enemies. So I think with that, I guess my uh, final set of questions for the two of you for our chat is, uh, as I said like at the start, like Long Long Days is officially out. For people listening to us right now, the game is available on Steam and then is available on other platforms as well. Yeah. It, oh. <laughs> it's available on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4 and 5, and uh, Xbox Series X and S. And it's also on the well other platforms like itch.io, um, Game Jolt, and Humble Bundle. <laughs> All right, and on the Epic Game Store. Nice. And I guess uh, my question for the two of you then is like, uh, what is next for your studio? Do you have anything planned for more with Long Gone Days? Have you started thinking about another project? Like, if, what's going to happen next uh, for the three of you? Uh, well, right now we're 
taking a bit of a break. It was a really long uh, developing process, and expe especially the the release of the mm -hmm. game was uh, really tough. So we're taking a bit of a break uh, now for the holidays, and we we have intentions to keep working together as a team. Uh, we don't know yet if it's going to be on long on days or if if it's going to be on a different project, but we want to stay together. So ex expect something, uh, but I don't know when. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I guess with that, any uh, final points, anything else uh, the two of you would like to mention about long on days before we wrap things up for our chat? Um, not really, but. We do hope that you you uh, people get to play the game, and that if you like them, if you can leave a review <laughs> on Steam and stuff like that, and just also let us know uh, what you think and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and and we also like to receive uh, fan art of our characters and from the game. So if you like drawing, or if not, if you don't write. Uh, uh, draw really well, it doesn't matter. We just like to see uh, a lot of fun art for our game. <laughs> All right. And uh, to end our discussion for tonight, and you like to say to the fans watching to take us out? Uh, well, um, I, I want to thank most of our fans uh, for their patience because a lot of our, like, especially on our Discord server, there's people that has been waiting for the release of the game since 2016, I, at least, or 2017. So <laughs> uh, we want to thank them for their patience because it was a really long developing process. Uh, but uh, we want to thank also the new fans that we made uh, since the release. There was a lot of people that were waiting to to get the game when the story was uh, completed and they got the game now. So we want to thank them because uh, it was really, uh, really helpful for us to keep us motivated uh, and seeing people like really interested on in the game and that really wanted to, to see it complete. So. Yeah, that's mainly what I want to thank our, our fans. But yeah, we, well, once again, yeah, we are really thankful to our fans because I personally, I was really scared that at some point they were going to get angry or ask for refunds or stuff like that because we were taking so long. And instead they were like, oh, don't overwork yourself, guys, take a break. Don't worry, don't crunch. We, we, we didn't crunch. <laughs> um, it, it was really nice. We always try to keep an honest uh, an open conversation with them. Uh, so I think that meant the difference. And that's why they were always so kind with us. And even when some people arrived in the server and they were a bit rude towards us, people started defending us like out of nowhere. <laughs> and it was really nice. We well, we couldn't be able. We wouldn't have been able to release the game if it wasn't for them. All right, fantastic. So, uh, with that, I think we'll wrap up our discussion. Uh, Camilla and Pablo, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk about the game. And again, uh, congratulations on the release, and uh, best of luck to whatever you uh, decide to work on next. Thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> All right. Uh, so with that said, for the people watching this record, we're going to end things for our chat. Thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying this on YouTube, do that YouTubing stuff. Check out our Discord and Patreon. And uh, if you are a developer working on a game you'd like to come on and talk about with me, uh, reach out. I'm free for a recorded and uh, live podcast chats. Uh, for the two of you and for your studio, anything you'd like to mention in terms of social media, shoutouts, sites, links, whatever? Uh, well, it's hard to say the uh, URLs here, but uh, you can follow us on Twitter. 
And we have a, our own Discord server for the game. Um, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, no problem. I'll include those links in the description down below for the folks watching this. So, uh, with that said, everyone, come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. And until our next chat, have a great rest of your night.